We're so glad you decided to join us today. God wants to do so many things for you and through you, and we want to hear about it. So please share your story at mystory at expchurch.org. And if you want to contribute financially to our ministry, all you have to do is go to expchurch.org slash give, and then select the giving option that works best for you. I hope you enjoy this message. of the Lord this morning. Are you glad to be here? I'm excited about what God is doing. Before we get into worship this morning, I do want to invite all of our kids. If you would like to go ahead, you guys are going to be dismissed for Children's Church. I think a lot are already there, but if you would like to, it's children under the age uh, or fifth grade and down. You can follow Pastor Pat in the awesome pink shirt, or well, salmon shirt, sorry. And (laughs) next Sunday, I want to make sure everybody is aware of this. We are going to be having a pool party at Pastor Pat's house next Sunday after church. And uh, we're hoping that it's still going to be nice and warm to be able to uh, have our kids go and enjoy that. It's going to be a great time. So I am excited about what God is doing today. We're glad to have Jordan and Kayla Pratt with us this morning from Nashville. Very excited this morning. Hey church, why don't you stand on your feet this morning? Who here has a testimony of the goodness of our God? Come on, every hand should be raised in this place. I'm not asking anyone to come up here and take the mic, but I just want us to be in agreement this morning that our God is far better toward us than we could ever work for, imagine, or deserve in our own strength. It's His grace, amen. And that's the reason we're going to sing our praise to Him this morning. So I want to encourage you to move around a bit. This song talks about us dancing because He is good. So that means we're not rooted to the spot. That means we're not standing with our hands beside our sides. We're clapping them. We're making a noise in this house. Come on. Good in the sun, in the sun. 
good to you today. Just lift your hands in this place and say thank you, Lord. Oh, we just bless your name. Because all good and perfect gifts come down from you, Father of lights. We bless your name today, Father. Oh, I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am.
thankful for his blood, thankful that he is a father that loves us. Come on, just worship him today. We sing. 
I'm going to come from a place where my good friend Rachel did the exhortation last week. And it was one word and it was welcome. So I'm going to start there. Welcome. You are welcome here. You are welcome in the family of God, not just in this house, not just an expression church, but you are welcome in the family of God. Just let that set for a second. Because I don't want to rush over that. On Wednesday, Pastor Kevin was saying something that was, it brought a remembrance to my heart. And he was saying, there's things that we need to do as a body. There are things we need to know and grow in as a body. So we can't spend all of our time in an emotional place trying to get someone to know that they are welcome. And I remember growing up, I believed in God. I believed in Jesus. But when I was in my early 20s, something different started happening. God started putting people in my life and he began tugging on my heart. And I remember I came to a church service deep down in my heart, I didn't tell anybody. I was like, I'm going there to get saved. Like I knew before I even went, that's what I was gonna do. And I remember thinking when I walked in, I wish I could just go ahead and do it now. Do I have to wait to the end? Because I'd been in church when I was a kid, I knew how it went. And there was a, usually an altar call at the end. But God, he really loves me. And he heard my heart and this lady came up, I mean the announcements hadn't started, church hadn't even started, worship hadn't started. She come up to me and she said, honey, did you come to get saved today? And I said, yes, ma'am. So she took me up front and we prayed before the service even started. And I went back to my seat, positioned to grow, positioned to receive because I knew at that point I was welcome. And when you know you're welcome, you can stretch out your legs and you can relax because you're at home. So I'm gonna start off today with that. If the Lord's put anybody in your life or he's just been tugging at your heart and you believe in God, but you know there's not really been this moment where you've just been like, God, I just surrender it to you. And you wanna Start what's already started, but in your mind, it's going to start today. You're just going to have an awareness of it today. If you just come on up here, I'm going to have somebody pray with you. Don't hesitate. You're welcome. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. There's no hesitation. Is there anybody in here that I'm speaking to about that? Come on up. Can I get someone from my acceleration team up here, please? Anybody else? Come on. We're not in a rush. We're family. We're family. Come on, you can still come up if that's you. All right. So this is the beginning of what I'm here to say. So last Monday, we were at a real life school of ministry and the Lord was really speaking a lot of things. And I know I'm supposed to share 
It's an activation point. He told me, he said, Stacy, I need you to share that today because it's an activation point for my people. And what I saw was a big pool and a diving board. And he said, I want my people to just dive deep into my trust. I want you to just dive deep into my trust. I want you to picture that for a second because it's really important. The Lord's going to give you a picture of it. The diving board and what it sounds like. Why would he say that? Not, I want you to dive deep into my love. Yes, he wants us to do that. But there's something specific about trusting him for, that we need to understand to completely submerge ourselves in for us to move forward to where he's calling us to go. Because we're going somewhere, do you hear me? And as I begin to say that, my husband said, as you begin to say that, the Lord showed me that he was changing the altar to a diving board. So a lot of times when we hear the word altar, we think of this moment. We think of the end of a thing, a place where all regrets, all shame, all of that goes, and absolutely that is true. But there's a place beyond the altar. So everybody in this place that already feels welcome and you've already identified yourself as part of the family, this call is to you. And no one, I'm telling you, no one is excluded. No one. There are either specific things that have been in your heart and in your mind that you feel like you've not completely released and trusted God in. Maybe you felt guilt and condemnation about that. Don't do that. Let's just leave that alone. No guilt, no condemnation. We're sitting at the table. This is family time. And some of you, you, it may not even be one specific thing. There's just something in your heart that says, I know that there's more for me. In that song earlier, it says, I've searched for the answer. He is the answer. The scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all things will be added to you. So everything that you, are, you care about and are concerned about, and when we care and are concerned, we have worry attached to that sometimes because we care. God will add all of that to you. He is calling this house today to jump, to dive deep into his trust. So when I do this altar call, it's not for that type, but it's all the same thing. So whoever it is, I'm telling you, I saw a multitude of us saying, God, I'm ready just to dive deep into your trust. I don't know what that looks like, but you can't tiptoe off of a diving board. You can't go into the shallow water and just fill the water a little bit here and get used to it and then fill a little bit more and get used to it. When you jump off the diving board, it's all in. So who's all in? I'm telling you, you may think that you don't have to step forward and I'm not putting anything on you telling you that you do, but there is something about jumping. And the Lord showed me that it's a very specific activation point this morning. If you will just come up here and fill this front area because the Lord is moving on everybody in this place. You can stand, you can worship. We're getting ready to go back into some worship. And at that time, it's just gonna be you and God. And I want you to see yourself jumping off that diving board into his deep trust because we are moving in his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep. 
bowed right now and every eye closed in this place. Who in here struggled? You had nightmares last night that kept you up. There's somebody in here that had a nightmare and you struggled to remember what it was, but you remembered waking up afraid. Can somebody, if that's you, can you just raise your hand? Yeah. 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 I see you today. I want to pray right now protection for your mind right now because God is saying specifically that he's opening a wellspring inside of your mind and the enemy would like nothing more than to just bombard it and muddy the water but the Holy Spirit is going to begin to flow in your mind and give you clarity and those night those terrors at night and those nightmares have got to cease in Jesus name complete freedom from all panic who in here has had anxiety and uh, again if you could just bow your head and close your eyes and no, no one has to see this but how many of you all in here struggle with anxiety to the point that you can't get a deep breath yeah I see you right now the wind of the Spirit is supposed to fill our lungs there's a reason that we're feeling stifled and it's hard to take a deep breath and it's because our breath needs to be replaced by the Spirit so, Father, I know I hear from you. I know I hear your voice. So, God, for those that cannot breathe, that are just having that struggle, Father, I pray that the wind of your spirit begin to just blow in this place right now, Father God. God, I just pray, Lord, for every anxiety and panic attack to cease in this house right now. No more anxiety right now in Jesus' name. Father, we love you. We trust you, Father. We know that your kindness is good and extended to every single person. Father, we love you. Those of you that in here that struggle with that, just take a deep breath for me right now. Just feel the, feel the wind of his presence right now. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father God. Oh, thank you. Let's just sing this together. We sing hallelujah. Sing it out, church. Say, we sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is over. He's overcome everything. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. He's overcome depression. We sing hallelujah. He's overcome anxiety. We sing hallelujah. He's overcome all marital issues. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. Come on, sing it out, church. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Come on, take it up. The Lamb has overcome.
you to shout to him today. Thank him for victory. Come on and somebody just thank him for victory today through his name. Because he has overcome, we can overcome as well. Find two or three people right now. Let them know that you're glad to be in church with them this morning. Don't let anybody go without a handshake or a hug. Just let them know how glad you are to be with them today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hey, good morning, church. How's everybody? Good morning. You look blessed. I'm blessed to get to worship with you guys. I feel like I've said this a hundred times. I feel like I'm getting away with something. Don't tell anybody. Hey, before we get started here, taking, taking up our tithes and offering this morning, is there any first-time visitors here with us? Thor, just raise your hand. And if there's not, we welcome all of you again, as Stacy said earlier. We're going to take a pause this morning. We're going to continue to worship God in our tithes and offering. You know, and I was, uh, my wife's got a picture on her phone of, of, the, of the little white church there on Adams Ave where we started, you know, and, and we look at the picture of the of, of where we've come from there it's, it's quite a contrast do you agree with me but you know but don't think for a minute because the unashamed vision that drives this church for Jesus that four years from now we won't be able to turn around and take a look now and see even a greater transformation of what we see then you agree I can't wait I'm looking forward to it the vision of this church is to build a body of believers that expresses Jesus Christ in their everyday life. A church that's successful and a church that's confident and a church that's prosperous and a church that's mature and strong. And that's what we're building here. I'm, 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 I'm honored to be part of y'all's family. You know, it's God's will. The first, I'm reading a, a, a book, a reading from a book that I've had for a long time, and it's fresh revelation right off the press. It's copyrighted in 1949 by Finnis Dake. Anybody ever heard of Finnis Dake, a famous commentary who wrote God's Plan for Man? And, it, and if you've ever got that book, man, it's a, it's a mess. I can read about a page a week. But it, it's God's will for us to prosper. And you have to understand that to be able to worship God freely and comfortably the way that he would have us to follow him. And, and a couple of scriptures that I was reading this morning from 1 Kings says, Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow him in all of his ways and keep his commandments and regulations and decrees as written in the law of Moses, so that you will be successful in all that you do and wherever that you shall go. And in Job, it says, if you listen and obey God, you will be blessed with prosperity all throughout your life, and every year of yours will be pleasant. In First Chronicles, it says that wealth and honor from you alone, God, you rule over everything, power and might are in your hand and at your discretion you make your people great and give them strength and wealth all that's from the old covenant and then as Pastor Kevin and Steph this morning has been teaching as we are washed in the blood of Jesus that old covenant is made much 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 more greater than what he has brought and done for us so it's God's will and those, those, those scriptures there about prosperity are not 
tied to the fact that you give to be prosperous. Although God's covenant allows for that, the kingdom of sowing and reaping will remain as long as the earth remains, that God will give you provision to sow and that you will reap. Press down, good measure, shaken together, running over. But your prosperity is not exclusively tied to that because prosperous people give. So if you are prosperous, you can follow your heart and give out of the generosity that God has placed within you. And if you are not prosperous, you can sow the seed as a mustard seed. And God will give it increase throughout your life as you follow Him and bring you to where He wants you to be financially. Amen? You follow me? And we bring our tithes and our offering in the house today because we love Him and we honor Him with it. Amen? So if anybody needs an offering envelope, we're going to get ready and do that. If you do, just raise your hand. There should be some underneath the seats maybe if you look. But you can just jump up and shout if you need. I don't care. Jumping jacks, whatever. We'll get you what you need. You can fill out that. Write your checks out to Expression Church in Huntington, ECH. You can give on your app. And I still today don't remember the number for the text. 84321. I apologize for that. I'm old. We probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of about eighty some thousand dollars that we need to finish up, you know, what we've done so far to be able to get into the building. If anybody wants to take care of that, eighty thousand is two words, eighty and then T H O U S A N D. If you're writing that out, and that's fine. But that by no means says that we're in a landing point. That means that we're, as I remember, as, as uh, my son was learning to fly, that's a touch and go because we're coming in and we're letting the wheels touch and then we're taking right back off because of the, what I call it earlier, the unashamed vision of this church. That's going to go forth. And I thank God for it. Is everybody ready to give? Did I take too long this morning? I like looking at you. We've got lights in here. Hey, let's pray. How about it? Father, I just thank you so much. Father, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to worship you with my family, my church family this morning. Father, it's an honor to, to be able to come and talk about you and the covenants and of, the, of prosperity and financial covenants that you have with us. It, it reminds us of your goodness as we bring our tithes and as we bring our gifts to you, Father. So, so as we do that this morning, I just pray the release of everything that you have for every single person here. I, I pray protection and prosperity and wealth and wisdom to every giver, to every member of this church, to every family member that they have, Father. I pray that we use it for the best use that you have for this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hold that for a second. Hey. Yeah. The old guys need candy. <laughs> and you can pick it up at food fair. <laughs> 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 he said last week that uh, Food Fair gave 100 bucks, wasn't it? Yes, sir. And there's a sign-up sheet out there for anybody that wants to, if you shop at Food Fair, we're not obviously telling you where to shop, but we are saying if you shop at Food Fair, uh, they give back a portion, 2%. a 2% of the sale, if your name is on their register, back to the church. Right. And there's a sign-up sheet out there. Well, last week, when Tom got up and said he had a $100 check after service is over, this lady, Sonia Jolly, came to me and she said, I feel like I should have done something that I feel like the Lord should have told me to do. So I'm going to let you do it today. Well, do you remember the chairs? Mm-hmm. The Lord said, you got to give that, Sonia. So I started the chairs. I wrestled with him all week because... This hundred dollars hurts me. <laughs> and I said, I can't do that, God. 
and about the middle of the week, I called Ta Kevin and I said, God keeps saying that I've got to do it. He'll take care of me. Amen. 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 So I want to give you all a challenge. Every one of you. Anybody can do it. I live from paycheck to paycheck. And this is grocery money. And for $100, I can do it. For food fair, can do it. I shop food fair. Then I can do it, and I want every one of you to support me. You support this church, they need the money. And God has really put it to me this week. <laughs> but this is what I'm going to do, and I'm doing it in faith, and I want you to please, anybody that will do it with me, please hold your hand. So that Kevin knows what he's got. Please do it. One time against Food Fair. Let's go. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Uh oh. Here we go. Turn this Baptist church loose. It's all right. I love it. This morning before I was leaving, I was praying, Lord, just let me be a help to somebody today. Put something on my heart or somebody on my heart. Bring them my way. He said, you have $100 on your nightstand. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, put it in your pocket. Okay, I will take you to the person that needs that $100 today. Wow. It's your seed and your harvest. Amen. <laughs> if, I, if, I took a, if I took a slice of bread out of a, 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 a loaf of bread, if I, took, if I took a slice out, and I took the slice, and I know it's bread, but it's not seed, and I take the, 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 the bread, the, the, the piece of bread, and I plant it in the ground, thinking it's a seed, uh, go back and check about two weeks later, I dig it up thinking, man, I, I planted a seed there. No, you planted a slice of bread that you... Pick it up, you're going to get a wet, dirty, filthy slice of bread, thinking it's going to grow something. The Bible says that you give seed to the sower, but bread to the eater. And you've got to know what you're planting. You never plant your harvest, you plant your seed. Oh, that's good. Yeah. The, the, the sower, the reaper is going to overtake the sower, right? So as fast as you can sow it, it's going to be reaping. That's good right there. Dear Lord. Yeah.
Russia. That's good. Yeah. What's that? You've learned to listen. When he tells you to do something, do it. Yeah. I have to tell you what she said, though. Just kind of bring it up to this. this, this, this we're all just talking this Labor Day weekend. And uh, family all here. This this kind of weird how this is happening. Some lady that um, comes to the church, she's not with us this morning, but a lot of people out of town this week for the holiday, but she sent me a, she was here Wednesday evening. She had a, vi- a vision. She saw a bank teller window that was closed, had bars over it, and it said, it just said closed. It was not open. She said, I feel like the windows are, the teller windows are closed, but the resources that everybody's needing for their life is behind the, the window, and, but it's closed. And she said, I think you have something you can, add to that or figure out how to open that window. And uh, so I, I started praying about it, and I felt like a lot of it is, um, I have a, just to be real transparent, I have a real issue because I came from um, backgrounds where you, you play a lot on the emotions of people, and it's emotional. I mean, I, I've been in large church services over the, across the country where an offering was 45 minutes or an hour, or sometimes I'd preach a whole sermon to get to the offering. And I Gosh, so many times that would just settle not well with me. So I became a little jaded over the course of time on the money. And to the point one day where I saw a guy on television saying $65 a month for 65 months, you know, and all this. And I'm thinking, God, I'd turn it. And one day the Lord convicted me and said it was like $57 for 57 weeks or something. And I just was just thinking, goodness, there's no way. I mean, come on. And... And right out of the hills that he was talking about his airplane. And I'm going, $57 a week for, for a month, for 57 months for your airplane. And, I'm, and I, of course, I'm a preacher. And I'm going, God, I'm getting aggravated even more. I was walking down steps, and the Lord convicted me and said, give that man that $57. You're not giving it to him, you're giving it to me. I'm teaching you a lesson here. And uh, I said, there's no way. So I walked on downstairs, and I thought, That's, I rebuked the devil. I thought that was the devil. That's a, a true story. So I walked downstairs. And I thought, so I got, the more I walked downstairs, the more I realized, hey, this might have been the Lord, because I kind of know his voice, but I didn't like his voice at that time. And, and I thought, I thought, okay, well, if it's, if I'll go back upstairs on the television, if he's still on, I can get the telephone number. If I can get the telephone number, I'll be, I'll do it, Lord. So I walked back upstairs, and when I got back upstairs, he was going off. And I just had this sigh of relief that I didn't get the number. So the problem was, though, was Lisa was downstairs, and got the number downstairs on the television. So I come downstairs, and this has been years ago, and she said, here's that number, because I was kind of talking out loud. She goes, that number, I wrote that number down, here it is. So I had to give that man $57 for like 57 weeks or so. I don't remember what it was. I just remember being $57. But the Lord broke me of, it wasn't about him, it was about here, right? So I, I kind of been jaded. So what I'm talking about is, so this past week, the Lord truly convicted me of my weakness and my insecurity when it comes to being confident and bold 
on, on uh, receiving an offering or teaching on it. Um, vision sells people in to give. But the Word of God is what convicts and convinces people to give. And I have been guilty, and I repent of that to you, <laughs> of, of, of worried and concerned about being emotional or manipulating people to give. And I've erred on the wrong side where I've been so concerned about going the other direction, I want to make sure I don't over here. So I've actually abdicated my responsibility in pushing it off on the Lord, going, Lord, move on the people, and put it on in prayer. But the reality of it is what you saw today with the word being spoken like it was through people was just confirmation to me that I have been weak in teaching you about giving concern that you might misunderstand my motivation. So I apologize to you today, and that won't happen again. All right? I'm not trying to get something from you. We're trying to get you to hear the voice of the Lord to get something in your life. Because the teller, Patrice, teller wound is just open. Because I needed to do that today. Amen? Amen. Thank you all for allowing me to be transparent and honest uh, with you. Uh, Because what we have seen, uh, you know, you you have to, you you worry, when when Obadidim had the Ark of the Covenant in the house, when the Philistines come and took the Ark of the Covenant, you all remember the story? David, Israel lost the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was the presence of God. They took the Ark of the Covenant and stuck it in in Obadidim's house. Obadidim's house was entirely blessed because of the presence of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant was in the house. So when David becomes king, David says, listen, the first thing we're doing is getting the presence of the Lord back in the house. We're going to Obed-Edom's house. We're going back over there to the Philistines, and we're taking the presence of the Lord. It's coming. So David sends up a group of people. He says, we're going to take the ark back. Reason knowing because David recognized absence of the presence of the Lord, it's a hard life. Absence of the favor of God, the grace of God on your life, it's just how smart you are and how much you want to fight in the world system. And I know the difference. I know what it's like to tug and war against flesh and blood, but I also know, uh, know the difference when things just kind of happen and you realize you didn't have anything to do with it and you're just blessed and the blessing of the Lord is upon our lives because he favors us. Not just us, he favors his people. Um, just as much as the Jewish people were favored, Israel was favored in the old covenant, the Jews are favored, so are we to favor like that today. No different. It's the same covenant. Uh, He favored the old covenant, passed through the cross to the new. They're favored. We're favored. We're all favored. And um, just to tell you what, uh, just some things that have happened, and and for the sake of not sounding like we're arrogant here, that's not it at all, but just to confirm, the city of Huntington, when we were at the city hall auditorium, received in unsolicited donations over $300,000. And they hadn't done that in 20 years. Now, if you ask ask Maxine, Maxine's going to tell you, I am 100% convinced it was because we let the, the Spirit of the Lord in the auditorium. She could, you couldn't tell her any other way, okay? Well, who am I? That's her auditorium. That's her domain that she lives by. Now, since we have been here, since we've been connecting with people, some of the contractors that even had a part of this business, building this, their businesses have, I mean, flourished. They've grown. They've got contracts and opportunities that were, and they were already doing well, but now they're doing even with greater opportunity. Stacy, you had an opportunity this past week. There has one coming up with a, it's, it's bigger than, it's not a matter of can, uh, it, well, God bless me. It's a matter of, oh, my Lord, this is big. And I'm not saying directly it had because he was here. I'm just saying when you start getting in the will of the Lord and you start Amen. connecting with God's people, things just start happening for you. And I, you, can't, you can't make it happen. Yeah. That's a good example. Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand it all, but I know it's true. Okay? And we've lived enough of it to know it's true. Um, That air conditioner, when that thing turns off, it gets quiet in here. (laughs) Have you noticed that? So we're going to have to be, we're working on some of this stuff too, the air conditioning piece. 
we've moved the uh, vents up, so they should be going over your head or at least hitting the people in the very back. So we're going to keep adjusting those till we get all that right. Um, you're going to see, you've seen some gravel that's going down around the place for the parking lot, or it's actually for the sidewalk. Once the sidewalk's in, the parking lot comes right behind it. So there you go. When, you see, when the parking lot goes in, then you'll see the carpet go in, and the carpet will be right behind it. This, the next two weeks, you're going to see a lot of changes that will take place throughout the building. Uh, partitions and bathrooms will come in in the next two weeks. Um, stained com- concrete. What else? Water fountains up, Steph said. And, it's, and, and it, listen, this is a good place to play with your children right here because it's off a little bit on the, the pressure. So when you push the button, it goes way over top of that thing. So I had Caden in here that day. I said, this is incredible. I said, look at this thing. He's looking at this thing. And I pushed the button. It's just all over his face. I said, I said remember that. Remember that. He said, I got it. I got it. So today, all that water that you're going to see outside the, on the concrete, that's why we didn't carpet the main <laughs> auditorium area there, okay? Which is all good. Everybody good? See what I mean? Am I missing anything else? Well, the Lord's already done it anyway, so. Oh, Pastor Ron, you want to come up and do that? Uh, one of the gifts that were uh, given during this, the course of this time, which is pretty amazing, you just look all around and uh, yeah, you can see the gifts in steel beams, <laughs> in concrete poured and all these kind of things. But one of the gifts that uh, were given to the church, um, a, a man really felt moved by God to, uh, he, he had a brand new Winchester Model 410 rifle. And he really felt moved that uh, although he didn't have uh, the monetary gifts uh, to bestow, but he had this gun, and he felt moved that the Lord would have him uh, allow the church to raffle it. So in a sense, what he's given, uh, we have to kind of, it's, it's like a seed, and we have to do something with it in order to maximize the uh, potential of the seed, if that makes sense. Uh, and so uh, what we have are these really attractive-looking um, Expression Church raffle uh, ticket deals for this gun. Um, they're uh, $10 each. Uh, someone, I was raised by my mama and never touched a gun, okay? Someone thinks this is absolutely amazing. And you know these people. <laughs> uh, and if you do know these people um, and, uh, and you want, uh, you, you know, you think that they would be uh, not only interested in the gun, but maybe even uh, interested in being a part of this movement here, uh, I would encourage you to come see me or Pam Lemley uh, and get a few of these tickets, and uh, let's get these sold. We have a, a drawing date of September 24th. Um, uh, but this is just the way, you know, we were just talking about uh, putting the lighting in the sanctuary this past week and uh, uh, talking about the money that it would take to just get uh, that put forward and, and for this uh, stage to be set uh, in an even more beautiful way. Uh, and, and it was like, it's not a ton of money, but it, everything's not a ton of money. And then you start stacking them on each you know other. So uh, I just uh, I see something like this. I go, man, that knocks that out. Uh, with just a little bit of uh, us ma- uh, multiplying the seeds. So uh, come see me if you want to uh, help us uh, with this raffle. September 24th is when the drawing is. Um, but it's just another opportunity, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Jesus is coming up out of Jor- the Jordan area. And the Jordan River is on the banks of, the, of Jordan. And as Jesus is coming through, John the Baptist is down in the baptismal area, which is really called the Jordan River in his day, and he was baptizing all these people. When he saw Jesus coming from a distance, he looks up and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You all know that story very very well. Jesus comes down into the water, into the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan area, the Jordan River, Jordan River is just a small area, small river. It flows into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is just what it says. It goes nowhere else. But the Jordan River in the Jordan area is the lowest point in and on the earth above sea level. Okay? It's the lowest point. So I find it ironic that Jesus comes into 
the Jordan River to be baptized, and he gets baptized at the lowest point in the earth, right? John the Baptist baptizes him. Out of the water, Jesus comes. The Father in heaven says this, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, right? He gets tempted from there, goes out into the, uh, gets, up, gets descend, the Spirit of God descends upon him like a dove. He walks up out into the, the wilderness, gets tempted by the devil, and the enemy tempts him three times and says these words, if you are the Son of God, then this. If you are the Son of God, then this. If you are the Son of God, then this. Three different temptations that Jesus uh, over, over, uh, overcome by not yielding to what the devil had said to him or the enemy had said to him. I want you to think about this. God didn't say, if you're my, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm telling you, I have preached this message a million times. This is how this church was birthed through the expression of Christ in everyday real life by identifying, affirming, equipping, and releasing. That's our vision and mission. But I missed one word in the scripture. This is my beloved son, the one I love, and whom I'm well pleased. So when Jesus goes up and gets tempted by the devil, the devil says, if you are the son of God, he never wanted to remind him if he was the beloved. He just said, if you're the son of God. He didn't say, are you the, if you're the beloved son of God. No, he said, if you're the son of God. That's the, at the lowest point in the earth, Jesus is heard the Father's voice that says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my, at the lowest point of the earth, an affirmation comes from heaven that says, I love you. At the lowest point of the earth. Jesus goes up on Mount, I think it's Mount Hebron, Mount Hermon. He goes up on Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon, I looked up, is the highest point in the earth, in that region. The highest place where Moses was, and Moses got the law, the Ten Commandments. It was at Mount of Transfiguration. So he takes, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the top of this mountain, the highest place in the earth. The, 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 the glory of God shines on Jesus. The light transforms, and I see him in all his splendor. Moses and Elijah appear talking to Jesus. Peter says, this is so good. I want to do, build a memorial here. All of a sudden, the voice from heaven comes again and says, this is my beloved son in whom I well pleased hear ye him. Don't you think it's interesting? Two reference points that the father speaks to the son and says, this is my love at the lowest point in the earth and the highest point of the earth. So if the highest point of the earth, he sees him and says, this is my loved one. I love you. I'm pleased. At the lowest point of the earth, he says, this is the one I love and I'm well pleased. Where are you going to go in your trouble, in your life? Somewhere in between we all live. How can we ever doubt how much he loves us? How can we ever doubt how much he's pleased with us? No matter how low your life goes, Jesus has been there. No matter how high and how good it gets and how much you feel like you're all about that, you get full of yourself. Jesus has been there. Sometimes we look at Jesus and we say, I thank God he humbled himself down. But it looks like to me he also put some pride on the cross. He became sin that knew no sin. So arrogance as well as false humility got pinned on that cross. And everything in between. But there was a certain stamp that was placed on Jesus at his lowest place on the earth and the highest place of the earth. The lowest place it was, yes, you're my son, but you're the son I love. When you forget who you are, that he loves you in spite of yourself, when you forget that, you begin to measure yourself up against everything else and begin to go, oh, 
man, I tell you, I don't think I can make it. But something comes to light when you're jarred and remembered, when you get a blow in life and it just happens and you get knocked off your feet, you're going, oh my gosh. You're going, my, how things are, how bad, what, what do I got to do to make it different? What do I got to do to make it different? All you got to do is the first thing you have to do is remind yourself you're the beloved. He loves you. Man, but I flew off the handle and it didn't work out like I thought it was going to work. I mean, I don't know what else I should, I could have done it. I know you could have done it differently, but he still loves you. I know the, the bottom fell out of that job. I know the bottom fell out of your, your, your home. I know the bottom fell out, the bottom fell out, the bottom fell. But no matter how far the bottom falls, you're still the beloved. That doesn't change. How come? Because Jesus has already gone to the lowest part of the earth. David said it this way, if I make my bed in hell, there you are. David knew to rest in hell. If you're going through hell, I know the, the slogan says, if you're going through hell, you've got to keep on going. I'm telling you what David said, if you're going through hell, make a bed. Rest in it. How do you rest? Knowing it's all coming apart and falling apart, you can't change it anyway. You might as well let him do it. So you rest in him, and how do you rest in him? I hate when people tell me that, you need to rest in the Lord. Well, you come over here and put these shoes on, and you tell me how that looks to you. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, your, your, your marriage is falling apart. Things are falling down, to, and you're, you're losing everything you got, and things are, you don't have, you're just trying to go day by day, and somebody looks at you and says, you need, I'm praying for you, you need to rest in the Lord. And man, something rises up inside of me called holy boldness, and I'm thinking to myself, come on over here and let me tell you about resting in the Lord, because I mean, we're going to grapple, we're going to talk, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rebuke you in Jesus' name. How do you think that feels? Since you're going to, you want me to pray, you want me to pray and rest in the Lord. Let me, let me just rebuke you. Since we're talking religious terms here, let me just rebuke you in Jesus' name. All right? Yeah. But, but what happened, I get tired of that. I get, don't you, don't you mind what I'm talking about? Get religious. They mean well. God, they mean well. People mean well. They just don't know any better. They just don't know any better. They mean well. But they say, rest in the Lord. I'm thinking to myself, rest in the, what, what are the two things you have to rest in? Two things. I'm the beloved. And if he loves me, he favors me. If he loves me, there's no way I can go down. If I go down, i got to bounce back up. There's no way I can lose. If I lose, it's temporary loss that has to be given back to me with much gain. Because if I see everything I lose as my harvest and not my seed, I realize when I'm losing some stuff and it's getting away from me, and I'm going, dear God, what's happening here? What's, what, what's, what, this is falling apart on me then I realize I might be trying to hold on to something that I'm really supposed to sow. If I start seeing it as a seed, I'll give you an example. There was a guy one time that I was talking to, and every time I would talk to him, he would talk for like a long time. And he had a lot of Bible stuff to say, and I always felt like he was trying to trip me up in Bible questions. So he would look at me and he would say, what, did, <laughs> how many animals did Noah have on the ark? And I thought, well, you know, at 7 o'clock in the evening, that's a pretty good question. But at 10.30 at night, it's not a good one. I'm ready to go home. I've worked all day. Things have I'm tired. My family's home waiting on me. And you're wanting, you're, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, he didn't work the next day. So I'm going, how about I do this? How about I call you at 5.30 in the morning when I get up and I'll talk about Noah in the ark. All right? But we didn't go there. And, but it was going my head. And I looked at him and I said to myself, I thought, man, this is, this is like 10.30 at night here. So over a period of weeks, this would happen. And, I would, and I will, I'm not the kind of guy that will avoid you. I will talk to you and, 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 and we'll, I'll, be, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. So finally, I, I said it. I said, I got to be honest with you. I said, listen, you know, I feel like you're trying to trip me up here. And I said, I'm all for a good conversation, but weeks after weeks after weeks, I feel like this is not going anywhere. And he says, what are you trying to say? I said, I said, I feel like you're trying to trap me up into, I don't know how to make it any clearer. You're trying to trap me up into something, and I feel like it's just not going anywhere. It's just going on and on, and it's taking some time. So he said, oh, okay. He said, I'll, I'll, I know what you're saying. I'll try to do better. I'm not joking. The next day, it's 8 o'clock at night, and, I'm and I want to talk to this guy because he's got a ton of knowledge. I want to I pick his brain. So as we were talking, all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me and said, up to this point, your family was sowing you into him, but now if you stay here any longer, you're being stolen from them. And I looked at him and I went, 
I got to go. He said, well, we're not done talking. I said, no, you're not done talking, but I'm done listening. I said, I got to go. And I got in my car, and man, on the way home, the Lord kind of convicted me and showed me that, listen, you, you're in control of what you invest in as seed and what you see as harvest. So if I feel like I'm struggling over and over and over again with things and things are getting away from me, I have to start evaluating not if I have sin in my life, not if I got people around me that are wrong. I start evaluating how do I view that commodity of time, money, ministry? What is it? Do I see it as time? Is it as a seed that I'm sowing? Or is it a, something I'm trying to hold on to that I'm losing? And more times than not, when it's starting to fall away from me, I'm finding that I'm holding on to it as harvest, as a commodity of, of something that I'm, it's my, my, my end result, and I'm losing it. I switch in my mind and say, listen, I know what I got to do. If I see it as harvest, that's as good as it gets. But if I can switch in my head and realize that seed, I can sow that into that. All of a sudden now, I don't take ownership of it because I've already sown it. And then I can expect the reward and to reap a harvest down the road on what I'm getting. Does that make sense? It makes sense in relationships, in time, in all the things that you're doing. Because many times, I've, I've done it. And, and, and the first thing that happens is I start looking around going, my God, what am I doing? Things are just falling apart. Or, and then I start swinging it, trying to keep everything in, in control. When you're losing things that you typically have in control, ask the Lord, is this my harvest I'm trying to control? Or is it seed that I'm supposed to let go and sow? So? And it's not just about money. It's every aspect of your life. Is it time? Is it peace? Is it joy? Is it relationship? What is that thing that you're holding on to that you think that's as good as it gets when you could just say, uh, is it sleep for some people? You see what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about just rest. I'm talking about sleep. I'm talking about the whole aspect of life. Now listen to this real quick. I'm not going to be real long because I'm going to close <coughs> soon. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says this. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of the dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are made heavenly. And we have borne the image of the man dust. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And watch this. <coughs> Excuse me. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Listen to this. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at that last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, how many of you have heard and believe, like me, that's talking about the last day? When we hear that last trumpet in the twink sound of a twinkling of an eye, man, that's going to all change, and we're going to all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Amen? That's a promise we have. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead and, and will be raised incorruptible. For the trumpet will sound... And when the sound of the trumpet sounds, we will be raised incorruptible. So in other words, what he's saying is, until that trumpet sounds, everybody's corruptible. Y'all believe that? And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written then. After the trump sounds, 
after we're changed in the twinkling of an eye, after the corruption, corruptible has put on incorruption, then this sound shall say, O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in love. Now, here's my question for you. Has death, is death still have more power than Jesus Christ? Huh. No. Is Christ the most powerful being, if we could use even that word in a limited fashion, is Christ the most powerful in all heaven and earth? Jesus said, all power has been given to me in heaven and in earth, right? Then, if he's all-powerful, and we have to wait till the sound of the last trump, where we're all changed in a twinkling of an eye before we can say, death, where's your sting? Then, do we have something out of order? Maybe... Maybe the twinkling of an eye, and maybe the, loud, the sound of the last trump, and I'm not saying there won't be a last trump, because I know there will be. I'm saying that the last trump you could have heard before you had a twinkling of an eye could have been the revelation that Jesus destroyed the key, took the keys of hell and death. And when you believe that, you take on incorruption and you put down corruptibility. So maybe the twinkling of an eye and the turning of the eye are, is the eye opening of you once were blind, but now you see. Because I'm having a little difficult time of death getting glorified and the church waiting on something to happen when we say Jesus is the most powerful thing in the world. Because if, if somebody has cancer and they die, and death has more power than Christ, then death becomes your savior to heaven, not Christ. Oh yeah. Are you, are you guys getting any of this? This is really important. You were born earthly into Adam. Everybody, Adam sinned. His sentence of sin came upon us. You had nothing to do with that. So if that happened in earth and we put on corruptibility so we were all corrupt because of Adam, then when Jesus dies on a cross, takes back the, death, the, the keys to death and the grave, puts them in his pocket and says, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. He put on incorruptibility. He became corrupt, even though he wasn't corrupt. He put on incorruptibility, even though we were still corrupt. When we believe in him and hear that gospel, our eyes are open and the twinkling in the eye open. When you take on that incorruptibility, you now have victory over Amen. death Amen. and hell. Yeah. Death, where's your sting? Hell, where's your victory? You don't have that. Man, Jesus went to hell, split it wide open, and brought back the keys. Not only brought back the keys, he brought back everybody with him that heard the gospel. Right? So we're no longer living in this world. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, it said. As long as you are still trying to live in a corruptible life, what I'm saying corruptible, I mean earthly. When you recognize, when you still see everything as it still has to happen, you're still living through a filter and a lens of an eye before it's twinkled. A before twinkled eye thinks Jesus still has more work to do. A post twinkled eye believes Jesus has already finished all the work. The view that you see determines corruptibility or incorruptibility. One fears death, the other D death fears. Sickness 
is we're afraid of sickness over here because it goes with Adam. It goes with, in, with corruptibility. It goes with a pre-twinkled eye. But a post-twinkled eye, sickness is afraid. Jesus comes walking into a city. They go, oh, are you come to torment us before our time? When's the last time somebody came up to you and said, hey, I know you. You're the son of God. You come to torment us before your time? When's the last time? You may not know this, but they know you. Disease is very well of who you are. Cancer is very well of who you are. Addiction is very aware of who you are. Spirit of affirmity is very aware of who you are. They're more aware of who you are than you are aware of who you are. They know your post-twinkled eye, and they know we're still living in our pre-twinkled eye. What are you going to do when you hear the trump? And the trumpet sounds. And I'm not talking about the last trump on the, on, on the carrying away of the church. I'm talking about the last trump in your life. Amen. I'm not talking about just when you're going to die. I'm talking about when you realize, man, I got Christ living inside of me. I, I've got the one that destroyed death and took the keys back of the grave living inside of me. You, man, you'll be twinkling that eye all day long when that becomes a real, because things begin to say, take a different view. So the, the twinkling of an eye is really this. What lens are you seeing from? Is it a lens that Jesus still has work to do? Or is it a lens that Jesus has already finished the work? Is it a lens that says, my God, no, by no means nothing can come against me. See, the Bible goes on to say in that same passage of Scripture, it says this. It says, when, now, when Jesus has all of his enemies under his feet, then this thing going to get real. How do you have the key to the death and the grave? You have a key. How do you have the key to those things and still think there's still some, yet something to happen? So when you wake up in the morning... And bills are flying over your head going, my God, I'm overwhelmed. When you wake up with, with, with just things aren't working the way you think they should work, your body's not cooperating, your mind is just not working, things are just, kids are just going crazy, things, and it's stress and strife and arguments and all this stuff is happening. The first thing you got to see is, which pair of glasses am I going to work on? Am I going to put on my pre-twinkled glasses or my post-twinkled glasses? If I put on the ones that corruptible, I'm going to look through everything that's agitating, aggravated, frustrating. I'll start yelling back because the only way to get back at flesh is operating flesh. And before you know it, you're trying to figure this thing out on your own. My God, my God, this is, and everything's agitating, you're getting under your skin. If you put it on here and you say, ah, no, I can recognize I am the beloved son in whom he's well pleased. Yeah, but you have no idea. You just went off yesterday and lost your salvation. Well, guess what? Mercy's new every morning. So you wake up the next morning and say, do I have to start all over? Do I have to keep going back and picking up where I left off, or can I just pick up and go from here? Do I have to go back and pick up the pieces? No, not always. Those pieces will come to you in the front. You don't want to have to go back and pick up those pieces until those pieces pe reappear in your future. When they reappear in your future, you go towards those things and say, I'm coming to you with a pair of glasses and a lens of life. That's incorruptible. And no matter what the enemy tries to put at me, it can't take me out because I'm his beloved. Amen. You remind yourself of who he is, remind yourself of who you are, and remind yourself of who you are to him. Yeah. Yeah. And when you remember those things, you don't have to sit around and worry. If your life ended today, you'll be with Jesus. Yeah. If your life stays a, another day, I'm still with Jesus. I don't have to go to heaven to be with Jesus. Jesus came to earth to be with me. So whether I'm here or whether I'm there. So I'm going to close with this. In Revelation chapter 21, the Bible talks about this big old beautiful crystal sea, this river, the river of life that flows 
with, with life, and the water was flowing. And it says that there was this tree that came up out of that river, and the branches went to one side, had leaves, and branches went to this side that had leaves. And I look at this thing, and it says, the leaves were for the healing of the nations. So Jesus is the tree of life. Would you all believe with, with me there? The river is the spirit of God. So out of the river grows the tree. Out of the spirit grows Christ. With a branch and leaves on this side. And a branch and leaves on this side. And the leaves were for the healing of the nations. So that tells me that the spirit flows like a river. And Christ has branches. Wait a minute, though. Jesus said, he's the vine. We are the branches. So that means on this side of the river, earth, there are branches. I'm looking at them. Out of those branches are the leaves, which are healing for all the people on the earth. But over here, there's a branches, people that have gone on before us. That's heaven. They're already there. That's mama and daddy and grandpa and grandma and aunt and uncle and baby and sister and a brother and all the people that have gone on before. They're already there. They're branches too. So they're in heaven with leaves and fruit of those leaves that are healing for the nations. So you, you can get your healing there or you can get your healing here. It's just spirit. Christ is the branch of the tree, the vine, and we are the branch. It's which I do you see. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Which lens do you see from? Stand to your feet, please. Would you buy, just bow your heads with me for close your eyes just for a moment? I just want to pray this over you. The word trump in the Bible, trump, trumpet, it's, like, it's, 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 it's noted like a ram's horn but it, it really means a voice. It means a sound. It's the same word that's used on the day of Pentecost when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was sent and they heard a sound like a rushing mighty wind. They said it was a rushing mighty wind. It was like a rushing mighty wind. There was a sound. I'm, I'm going to pray. See, there's two ways of living life after you're saved. And one of the most frustrating things in the world for people, and including myself, is to be saved, filled up with God, love God, centered on God, but still live a life like you're like, it's pulling you or you're pulling it. Or you're pushing it and it's pushing you. And everything around you just, just isn't satisfying. When you get to that place, it's time to twinkle the eye. You gotta come to the end of that corruptible life view, world view and come over here to the incorruptible view where you're able to see heaven and earth aren't separated by an event. They're only separated by a dimension. And the dimension is alive over there just like it's alive here. And what you can't recognize is you can't see them, but they can see you. Oh God, help us to peel back the layers of film that's over our eyes that we're able to see deep into the dimensions of the spirit parents the best thing you could ever do is lay your hands on your kids and even though you may not even be able to see it fully is to pray that their spiritual eyes would be open that they would see in the dimension of the spirit grandchildren nieces and nephews, parents, grandparents, pray for them. 
I'm reminded of why this church is even here today is it was a lady, if you would just allow me this with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, it was a lady, it was Kathy. Kathy had breast cancer and was dying. It was at the last tell, look, few days of her life and I got a call from her husband and said, hey, you probably want to come and see her. She's got some things she wants to share with you. So I naturally thought I was going to go down and pray for her and lay hands on her and hope she was going to recover. If she didn't recover, I knew she was saved. She was a saint of God, Mingo County girl. So I went down and walked in this room and actually he had he asked Steph to bring her guitar. So her guitar was there. She was there going to sing songs to her and maybe, you know, something would happen. We didn't know. So I walk in this room and Kathy's sitting up on the bed. <laughs> Never forget this as long as I live. As Kathy was sitting up on the bed, she started praying. And I looked at her and I thought, my God, she don't look sick. And she started speaking to me and she said, and her eyes got a little glassy. And she started telling me what she was seeing from over there, even though her body was still over here. She began to tell me about starting a church. I didn't want to start a church. I wasn't even in a place where I would, could start a church. She started telling me what she saw across the country and why the people in the, in, the, in, the, in the shape of the body of Christ was in and the shape the country was in, and what it was going to take for... And I realized about 15 minutes into this conversation that went on for a long, long time that she was sharing with me from behind the curtain of another dimension of what she saw for my life. And I had a choice at that point because I couldn't see all those things. Part of me wanted to start praying for her to be healed. And then I'll be, the selfish part of me said, no way, God, send her on over. I want her to see all over there so I can see. And for about an hour and a half, I think it was, she downloaded from heaven sitting in her bed while I sit right there at the edge of her bed with her husband, Ricky, Steph with her guitar, writing a song. And I'm hearing the will of God for my life. She died just a few days later. And you're standing in a building today in a congregation of people hearing a message of the gospel of the kingdom because a woman was already partaking of the leaves from a branch that was already on the other side, even though her body and mind were here. So Father, we acknowledge that moment today. And I'm asking you to grant us the ability and the power and the grace to capture what's happening there in a, in a real tangible way. Articulate it back to here with no hesitation or breaking point that we will be accurate in our prophetic words, we'll be accurate in our revelatory words, we'll be accurate in our life to where what we see there, we will see here. Just like she said to me, Father, your kingdom come in this earth like it is in that dimension. Father, we thank you, and I ask you to open up our eyes of understanding today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.